One of the difficulties, like what I'm doing now, is to keep the boat straight. So it doesn't go too much on the right or on the left. But that somehow you can do it. When you see that you go on the wrong side, you take on the right side. But the difficulty of this, of this project was that we didn't really have a professional team in place before we started the project. We had an idea, but then it was a project that was supposed to take professional from many different fields that were not used to work together. Finally, we got a team where people make an effort and everybody more or less has found this role and is working. We almost crossed the other side and now at the end of the project, I can say I have a wonderful team by which I would like to start the project. We need citizens engagement, definitely. We cannot work if people are not with us, understanding that it's about us, about citizens all over the world. We need to create this global citizenship, otherwise we cannot have real changes. Although the world economy and security have become highly interconnected and the well-being of each nation has a rapid impact on the others, nations are little prepared to work as a team in addressing the global issues. Although nations interact in a global village, they relate amongst themselves with inadequate spirit of solidarity. The Millennium Development Goal 8 is about promoting a healthy cooperation environment amongst nations. By making economic and political relationships fairer and dialogic, it will become possible to reduce the factors generating poverty and ignorance. Only a fraction of the funds pledged by the United Nations Member States for achieving the MDG goals has been allocated to actions against poverty. However, non-government organizations, the private sector and a number of developing countries are increasingly becoming significant sources of development assistance. A vast majority of people is opening up to curiosity about global issues and to learning from others. And today, there is greater acceptance in space also for culturally and socially diverse communities to enter into more peaceful and reciprocally fair relationships with each other. When we launched the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, all EU member states promised that they would allocate 0.7% of their GDP to development aid. Uh, this is not a huge money, but it's a money which really makes a difference because on the ground it is necessary. At the moment, we are not there yet. We are seeing countries which are making progress, others which are lagging behind quite seriously. So the Commission you know, really tries to urge all these countries to respect their commitments, both because it's a question of credibility. You cannot ask this country to get reformed, to do more economic reform, more political reforms, if you don't respect yourself what you committed to do. And second, because once again, it's in, it's in our interest. We have to have these countries now be safe, be secure, uh, be envi uh, environmentally friendly, protect the forests, protect the waters, because these are forests and waters which are contributing to the air with rest every day. Sweda is a city located in a famous ancient wine producing region of southwestern Syria, close to the country's border with Jordan. Most families in Sweda are Druze, one of Syria's smallest minority communities, constituting around 3% of Syria's population and mostly living in the rocky mountains of Jabal al-Arab. The Druze community is spread across Syria, Lebanon, Israel and Jordan. The Druze culture is very rich, but it is particularly vulnerable to the kind of nationalism that would like borders to be raised along religious and ethnic lines. In 2010, we traveled to Sweda to meet a group of Syrian youth who were participating in a cooperation project on rediscovering and reviving local heritage. This project was funded by the European Union through its annual donation support for cultural projects. It was implemented by a partnership of COSL, an Italian organization, and two Syrian organizations, the Al Makan Art Association and the Syrian Organization for Sustainable Development. This is my first personal aim 
pushing me to do this job, to learn from others. So uh, I uh, like to understand this job as a cooperation, which means that both partners learn from each other. In this project, the youth in Sweda and Palmyra work together to discover their heritage, both tangible, like architectural assets, and intangible, like songs, stories, customs. The youth conducted research on what constituted the cultural values upon which their communities had been founded, and they learned how to communicate these values in contemporary language. They used visual arts, theatre, internet and social gatherings, and they moved to different communities with the two project buses they had equipped for animating social events. In this way, they raised the awareness amongst local communities of how their heritage was a resource for development and not only a relic of the past. كمان مثل ما انتم شايفين التزيينات اللي فيه بنشوف بقايا المحاريب كمان كانوا يحطوا فيها التماثيل لعباده الاله فيه والحجاره اللي هون كان في مشرف هذا بنشوف الحجاره هذه كل حجر تابع للبناء موجود يعني هون مشان اعاده تاهيل المعبد probably when you when you are teenager you don't really realize uh, what what is now at the moment your future uh, and uh, what what will be your role in uh, in 10 20 years old اجت امريكا سمع شلون اوروبا الغربيه كلياتها بكافه دولها كمان العالم اجتحت العالم العربي العالم العربي او الشباب العربي بصوره خاص شباب مكافح سامع شلون ونشيط بحب العمل بحب انه سامع شلون يتطور على اكثر ما هو بعدين في ثقافه في ثقافه قديمه يعني اول اول ثقافه هي انه وجدت الثقافه العربيه يعني ما تفتكر انه في شيء حدث او شيء جديد على هالناس هاي uh, they, they start understanding what is needed for their country for the development of their country uh, they realize the differences between the different communities living in the same country and they, they question it and they, they, they start giving also their answers. Concept of an identity that is static is a huge mistake. So any effort to preserve identity is actually backward looking, static and frozen. So uh, even if you want to preserve your identity, you don't do it in a sort of a, in a locking your identity up type of way. Uh, definitely there are, the, the, uh, global, the global environment is increasing the possibility for countries to interact, no doubt about it, and cultures to interact. So I would be strongly in favor of anything that uh, increases that interaction. But you know, at the same time, uh, I'm not a great supporter of the idea of uh, all cultures merging into some pre-digested homogenized mush. So personally, I'd like to see uh, a sort of interaction of cultures where cultures absorb things from outside, contribute things to outside, but yet, yet kind of remain distinctly different. It's nice to go to another country and to find that you share a lot of values and yet it's different. It's not particularly nice to go to another country and it looks as, you know, ho-hum, it's exactly the same as you are. So how do you get that balance is the issue in my view. If I can give a, a message back to the United Nations, what I learned on the field, I would say the need of putting more poetry in uh, policy planning. Policy planning has become a bit a dry issue. I mean, you try to be objective, you try to give data, you try to set goals that are it's possible to, to, to monitor and evaluate objectively. These things are important, but they're not enough. I think if we want to have something which is really a global agenda, we cannot just have economic indicators and specific determinants which are objective. We need some sort of emotion, some sort of subjectiveness on which you can be a part. What I feel is missing by the development goals is a kind of song which represents the goals. It's a kind of poetry which represents them. Without a shared song, I, cannot, I feel that we cannot have a shared agenda. 
the modern idea of development is change, is construction, is uh, demoli demolition and making new things and moving forward and leaving the old behind. And um, development is not necessarily that. Development is respect for the old culture and building on the strengths that you have and then going forward. So it's not built on the on the grave of the old. It's change that is built on the uh, foundation of the old and uh, on the strengths of what, what, the, what exists. The government of Bogota formally recognizes the importance of cultural diversity and in its effort to re-establish traditional institutions, it supports minority ethnic groups, indigenous as well as of African origin, through its Department for Social Integration. When I started working with indigenous people, one of the things that, for example, the academia or the university, in general, was that the Muiscas didn't exist, that the Muiscas were the only people who 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 were the only people. Eh, una cultura extinta que habían sido, que ya ahora eran albañiles, que se dedicaban a oficios pues que habían perdido su, su memoria, que no existían. Entonces cuando yo conozco a los, a los, eh, a la gente del Cabildo Muisca de Bosa y entonces ellos empiezan a contarme acerca de la recuperación de la memoria, de sus costumbres, de sus tradiciones, empiezo yo a sentirme parte de eso porque Muisca significa gente, entonces eh, los Muiscas son originarios de este territorio ¿sí? y ellos al ser originarios de este territorio eh, representan lo que somos nosotros desde Bogotá. We went to visit the community center of Cabildo de Bosa, where activities of education and food security go alongside the rediscovery of ancestral values and the re-establishment of cultural identities. In este momento estamos en el Cabildo Indígena Muisca. Nos encontramos con el gobernador Henry Neuta, con el abuelo Gualcala y con el Taita eh, Orlando Gaitán y en este momento es la persona que está llevando como toda esa reivindicación del pensamiento ancestral. Todos, cada estandillo, cada palito que tiene, cada cosita, representa algo en el universo. Y aquí se hace ese recordar, volver a ese tiempo real. Entonces, eh, y así la gente se sana, porque en cada parte del tiempo hay enfermedades que van transcurriendo. Y vamos revisando qué es lo que ocurrió y revisar qué es lo que hay que hacer para no seguir enfermos. A la gente le tocó irse a buscar a, otros, a otras ciudades como la invasión española. An estimated 30 million people lived in South America before a series of official documents, or papal bulls as they are called, were issued by the Pope between 1452 and 1493, whereby Christian monarchs were authorized to take possession of non-Christian lands. This paved the way for the European colonization of the Americas. Since 1530s, both people and natural resources of South America have been mercilessly exploited by the conquistadors, and ethnic Americans have been massacred by wars, new diseases, and forced labor. El Ministerio Católico, que fue el, el principal destructor de nuestra nación indígena, nos tiene que ayudar. The Spaniards, forcibly or amicably, converted the survivors to Christianity. And as a result, native religions got largely wiped out of South America. Nosotros necesitamos vivir como los indígenas, toda espiritualidad, todo eh, trabajo en la agricultura. Para nosotros las comunidades indígenas, la siembra tiene un contexto más profundo. Uh -huh. porque eh, desde el pensamiento nosotros nos conectamos con la madre y todo lo que se siembra tiene un pensamiento, una orientación para nosotros mismos. Uh -huh. Entonces, pues estamos en una chagra uh -huh. que significa el mundo desde este punto y entonces se siembra uh -huh. en forma espiral. Uh -huh. Para nosotros la vida tiene una forma espiral, uh -huh. circular uh -huh. y va girando. Entonces se siembran, no se siembra una sola planta en un solo sitio, sino se mezclan con varias plantas, porque unas ayudan a las otras. Los mayores nos enseñaban eh, que no se, debe, no se debe sembrar bajo un interés 
lucrativo, uh -huh. sino es lo que la madre uh -huh. nos viene regalando día a día. Uh -huh. Y aquí es una escuela o una universidad, aquí donde se enseña, aquí hoy estamos atendiendo, pero ahí estamos enseñando a los jóvenes, a los ancianos también, a recordar su, su historia, su medicina. Yo creo que lo, que lo que yo estoy aprendiendo acá es a tener esa sensibilidad que uno pierde desde la academia, porque uno muchas veces se queda es viendo a las comunidades desde afuera, pero nunca está con ellas trabajando íntimamente. Entonces cuando uno, digamos, tiene la posibilidad de trabajar con las comunidades, desde adentro se da cuenta de que muchas veces lo que se dice en, en, en la academia o lo que dice, se dice desde el Estado no es tan verdad. O sea, lo que uno tiene que verdaderamente trabajar es porque lo que las comunidades piensan se refleje, no lo que el querer o el sentir personal de uno. Por ejemplo, este trabajo a mí me ha curado y me ha sanado profundamente porque me ha hecho recordar mis raíces, de dónde vengo yo, mis ancestros. En la comunidad de Cabildo de Bosa, la recovery de la ancestral memoria goes along with increased political participation and community service in education and food security. La continuidad de la vida a través de los niños, a través de los hijos. Entonces, aquí se revisa y en otra parte, que los niños, se va empezando a revisar cómo se va a vivir. O sea, aquí es donde se eterniza la vida. Entonces, aquí se muestra que la vida es eterna a través de los hijos. Although indigenous and mestizos populations suffered social exclusion and even self-inflicted inferiority complexes, still they preserved the ancestral values hidden within a secret receptory of their personality. However, now the spiritual resource is becoming an unexpected resource for cultural and political regeneration. La sociedad de, está totalmente volcada a los valores como de tener un cuerpo 90, 60, 90, tener un buen empleo, tener un auto, pero realmente el sentir dónde está. Cuando uno llega a la casa y se siente solo, eh, tu televisor o tu carro no te van a abrazar y, y, y no te van a hacer sentir mejor. Yo creo que en el mundo hay un movimiento y es el movimiento de recordar quiénes somos. ¿sí? Porque si uno no sabe quién es, no sabe para dónde va. Bueno, bueno. Ese sentimiento de, del pasado que ha sucedido de tantas um, dificultades, de esclavitud, de saqueo, de dominación, de enfermedad, de violencia, tiene raíces muy profundas de dolor de violencia, de desespero, de angustia, de tristezas. Muchos hemos perdido inclusive eh, tal vez la memoria de dónde venimos, qué somos. A través de este, de este ritual que se llama el ciclo de la palabra, el mambiader, mambiar, la palabra es pensarla, hablarla, a través de plantas sagradas como es el ambil, que es extracto de tabaco, y de la mambe, que es la hoja de coca, que es el ambil. El ambil es, es espíritu ancestral, es la conexión con, con lo divino, la conexión con el origen, con la ley natural. Allí está, a través de él, se revela todos los conocimientos, igual con el yajé, se revela todo el conocimiento de la humanidad, de dónde venimos, nos ayuda a recordar. Y al final de eso, ¿qué queda? Al final de eso somos nosotros los seres humanos los que quedamos. Imagínate con todas las catástrofes naturales que han pasado, todo lo que pasó en Japón, todos los desastres naturales. Es como la tierra está sacudiéndose. ¿Y para qué sirve todo el poder? ¿Para qué sirve tener todas estas torres si, con un, si, si simplemente con un, con un terremoto se cae todo? Por eso, este es el mundo de la ilusión. Entonces lo que les enseñan a uno los ancestros, lo que nos enseñan nuestros antepasados, 
esto es saber quiénes somos, de dónde venimos. Pero nosotros no somos solamente la mente, nosotros somos cuerpo, mente y espíritu. Y esa como esa, esa separación que se hizo de la mente y el cuerpo, eso nos ha dejado a nosotros totalmente desubicados, nosotros no sabemos quiénes somos. Entonces cuando nosotros queremos hablar de, de la espiritualidad, entonces viene el método científico y dice, no, pero es que el espíritu no existe. Pero ¿cuántas manifestaciones no se dan desde ahí? Por ejemplo, eh, cuando te hablaba de lo de las enfermedades, cuando uno está entre esos estados de desesperación, de ansiedad, de depresión, es porque una cosa es lo que el cuerpo está sintiendo y otra cosa es lo que el espíritu está sintiendo. Estamos sanando todo eso que pasó. Porque eso que pasó nos enfermó y tenemos actitudes o acciones todavía del pasado. Estamos haciendo un duelo, estamos reparando el daño que nos hemos hecho y que nos han hecho. Esta comunidad de paz busca una respuesta pacífica para no seguir en esa venganza, en ese dolor. Nos conectamos con esa felicidad, vemos cómo se vivía, en qué tiempo, cómo se hacía lo que se llamamos. Entonces buscamos esa respuesta, cómo practicarla en el tiempo de ahora. ¿En qué tiempo vamos? Lo que hacemos es mirar en dónde va el tiempo real y conectarnos en ese tiempo real. The political implications of rediscovering spiritual values goes beyond the local communities that are animating workshops for reviving ancestral memory. In Colombia, intercultural dialogue and reconciliation are proving to be regenerative, not only for indigenous groups, but also for all those trying to embark on a new path back to one's own lost soul. Haciendo la historia real, la tenemos presente y no la repetimos. Continuamos la evolución, la transformación. ¿Cómo transformar eso negativo en positivo? ¿Cómo atrapar la felicidad y estar alegres? Entonces esta comunidad es convencida de que la paz sí existió y que la podemos vivir otra vez. After having spent more than one year collecting stories about the work in progress for the Millennium Development Goals, we returned to Brussels, the headquarters of the European Commission, which was our main partner, covering 75% of the financial costs of the project. It was our contractual obligation to share with them the work we had done. But we wanted something more than that. We wanted to collect their side of the story and to say something about the challenges they face in maintaining and expanding the scope of international cooperation for development. Buongiorno Stefano, benvenuto a Bruxelles. My name is Antonio Manders and I'm a deputato de Hollandese. And this, these are people from my constituency, they want to see Brussels, they want to see what we are doing here. And I showed them the parliament and now they bring me a concert in the square of Brussels. So, bienvenido a Bruxelles. La grande differenza tra la politica delle Nazioni Unite e la politica europea è che mentre il concetto di, di sussidiarietà europeo permette di far sì di vedere come l'interesse dei vicini, per esempio, è anche l'interesse dell'Europa, certo. il concetto invece di interesse nazionale non sussidiario non è necessario mettere no, l'interesse dei vicini, anzi, anzi, fa sempre, anche... fa sempre pensare che l'interesse dei vicini in realtà è competitivo con l'interesse esatto. nazionale. In molti paesi dove abbiamo visto progetti in giro, met local stakeholders, the European Union has gained a lot of credit over the many years of cooperation that it's done with developing countries. What do you think is the main reason why European Union public is not aware of the credit it has gained? Well, it's, it's, it's a very, let's say, multi-level question. We try to sensitize the press by organizing press trips in the field to show what we do concretely, but it's true that it's 
small story. I mean, it's like a, a human story in one country. It's not a big picture. It's not macroeconomic um, uh, stories which are easy to, to, to show. So you can do it with people like you who are doing documentaries on the specific issues. But providing a story like at a macroeconomic level, it's much more difficult. But this is not just the green crisis or the Portuguese crisis. Now it's become an Italian crisis, perhaps even a Spanish crisis. God is very good to stop. But we can't be living in a parallel universe, can we? Now, in time of crisis, it seems difficult to spend money because we always search for money. And so there are many reasons why not to spend it. And assist, development assistance seems one of the easy way not to spend there. But, but actually, can we also say that this crisis we have now may be a reason why we didn't spend enough before? It could be argued that way because there are certain countries in the world. Now, for example, India and China and then Vietnam and uh, ASEAN countries, which are manufacturing things which we are buying, and they are buying things from us. So our, our industries, our pharmaceutical companies, our textile companies, our shoes, our fashion, our Gucci and whatever uh, goods we have, our eau de colognes and our perfumes, are now being bought by these uh, countries which 20 years ago were very poor. They wouldn't have even think of buying. So you see the interdependence, that's great. How can, we, how can we fill the gap of communication between what uh, is being done at the parliament and what uh, is the perception of the people on the ground? Well, I think you're right that the, uh, the perception of the people is that Brussels is very, very far away from them. We can solve that if the national politicians will bridge the gap, so if they say that the cooperation with the other European countries is necessary for our prosperity and for our economy. If they say so, then the people in the streets in Italy, in Germany and in the Netherlands, they will accept and can understand what Brussels is doing. Because now Brussels is more or less the enemy of the national parliaments, which is not the case, of course, because we are directly elected. I am elected in the Netherlands. My Italian colleagues are elected in Italy, so we are directly uh, uh, elected democracy and I don't understand that we are considered as the enemy of the real people. I was born uh, not in Latvia, I was born in Soviet Union because it was uh, occup have been occupied all day when I was born for 17 years. I was at school and I never could imagine that Latvia will regain independence. Um, the EU is as, uh, committed to reach 0.7% of the GDP um, dedicated to aid by 2015, uh, when we launched the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, all EU member states promised that they would allocate 0.7% of their GDP to development aid. Uh, this is not a huge money, but it's a money which really makes a difference, because on the ground it is necessary. Uh, I think it is still uh, that hope always is rewarded. You never lose the hope. And from this point, I, I would believe that Latvian in development commissioner's role is actually rather symbolic because of my country definitely went through the biggest changes in 20th and 21st century. With the new technologies from, from the last 15 years, we have been building real networks, which are worldwide networks, processes, which allow to, to, to work easily on equal terms. So, for example, I would like to mention one process where Concord is actively engaging, which is called the Open Forum on CSO Effectiveness, where um, thousands of organizations from all the regions of the world, including the Fijis, are talking about our own effectiveness, how a civil society organization engaging in development um, can be more effective to deliver, not to deliver aid objectives, which is a little bit the aid effectiveness approach, but to deliver development outcomes, which is our mandate to be effective in the work with the people and the community. So that's why we ask for development effectiveness approach versus the traditional aid effectiveness. How does growth support the realization of human rights and gender equality? How do we reconcile the changing global context, the needs of the planet, and the rising numbers of people living in poverty? MDGs come along with various indicators that help us to assess progress in various areas. Public investment is what creates growth. 
and what creates well-being. It's not austerity, getting rid of your, pri of your public companies, getting rid of your civil servants, etc. But that's what we are doing now. We need more public spending, uh, as with the New Deal in the 1930s in the United States. And what we need truly is a Green New Deal. Secondo me c'è molto pregiudizio da parte degli operatori dei media su quella che è l'ignoranza e lo stereotipo da parte del pubblico normale. C'è un atteggiamento un po', non, non dico presuntuoso, ma diciamo sfiducioso, sfiducioso delle capacità del pubblico di capire le cose. E quindi una corsa a ribasso. È una autogiustificazione di un certo tipo di intellettuali, un certo tipo di giornalismo che non si può fare un discorso intelligente al pubblico. Io credo che il pubblico sia molto più intelligente, e, e, diciamo, è sfiduciato, tutti sono altri sfiduciati rispetto a quello che in questo momento stanno dicendo i media, compra meno giornali, vede meno televisione, e, ma se, e, se gli intellettuali in genere, perché poi in fondo i giornalisti sono un tipo di intellettuali, ritrovassero la loro missione intellettuale, la loro responsabilità col pubblico, non facessero una corsa a ribasso, non diventassero soltanto agenti della pubblicità, ma ritirassero fuori quella che è la vocazione vera della loro, del loro giornalismo, della loro missione intellettuale, il pubblico li seguirebbe con, con molta determinazione, con molto coraggio, con molta forza e con in incredibile apertura. Calano le ombre della sera a Bruxelles, possiamo chiedere qui. We realized that the city we would like to come back to whenever we came to India uh, is Banaras. I love the city as much as sometimes I hate it. Um, I've grown up in different parts of India and although I feel my origins uh, in the land of Kashmir, which is where my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents belong to, I also feel myself a citizen of the country because I've lived in different places and I relate very well to people from different states of this country. Um, I'm a modern city girl and to find myself in the city of Banaras is a bit unusual because I would never have thought of ever coming and living in the city of Banaras. But my husband, who did his doctorate in the Banaras Hindu University, actually introduced me to the city. And what fascinated me about Banaras was how different realities could coexist together without stepping on each other's toes. My husband and I wanted to dialogue with this, with this reality, to try and understand it and to also to bring it into our lives. Because it gave us a feeling of authenticity, of uh, let's say a quest for truth that people had within the ambience of the old city. The old cities have a, a different spirit, but also a different reason to be, or raison d'etre, that's linked to the needs of people to feel each other, to interact with each other, to be in a community where interaction is closer, where cars are not there, where you move on bicycles, where you move by foot, and everyone knows each other. So it's a sort of a big village, uh, a big community in the old city. And India is a very good example of how many cultures have assimilated into, into Indian culture and uh, grown and evolved over periods, uh, over years and centuries. We wanted to make a, a non-government organization so that we could express this culture of dialogue also in the culture of partnership between different religions, between different cultures. We found an old building uh, which was not on the Ganga as we would have liked it to be, uh, but we found it just behind a big palace which was um, in the moment that we bought the house was bought by a chain of hotels. This building, this palace was uh, sold by a king and the hotel wanted to utilize this palace uh, for, uh, for, uh, for making a hotel. And so they started demolishing. And we realized that there was no law that could prevent anyone from demolishing an old building. And at that point, despite our um, attempt to, to, to take dialogue as the way to uh, resolve a problem, we were catapulted into a fight for protecting heritage. Uh, one of the major directives of the state, gov state government of Uttar Pradesh was a directive that nothing could be constructed 200 meters from the Ganges from the river Ganga and this was being flouted and so we finally after running from as they call pillar to post from government authorities to uh, local stakeholders to the media to, to press conferences 
uh, we realized that nothing was working. And so we decided to take, uh, take, take to the court as the last resort. There are three processes that are required in order to uh, protect any cultural, architectural uh, resource in any place. First is increasing the awareness of people about their, the value of their resource, about their resource, about the need to protect it, and about the way to link it with socioeconomic development. Because unless you do that, people don't support any kind of uh, conservation. They usually prefer development and change rather than conservation of what is old. Uh, because they don't see any socioeconomic benefit. The second thing that one needs to do is documentation. Unless you document and bring forth the actual value of uh, the resource, it's difficult to explain why that resource needs to be protected. And the third thing is legislation. Formulating legislation, designing legislation, and implementing legislation. And in this, either the government has it and the, and the government has already formulated a legislation that is not being applied, or there is no legislation, so there needs to be new legislation designed um, to protect that resource. Yesterday there was a demonstration uh, which was carried out by a um, traditionalist Indian political party, and they were asking the uh, local authorities to arrest me. Now, why did they want to arrest me? Why do they want to arrest me? They feel that the public interest litigation that the Kautilya Society has done um, in the High Court of Allahabad is wrong, is against the people's uh, wishes, and it's against uh, development. Actually, the public interest litigation that the society started some seven years back was done on the request of the local authorities and the eminent citizens and NGOs of this city. Because we were in a moment of history, a moment of uh, Banaras's development that required that the beautiful ghats of Banaras were protected. And protected against what? Protected against the, um, the wrong um, ideas of development which uh, associate development with construction and construction of new buildings, rather than building on what exists and developing it to become a resource for the community. Because that's why Banaras exists. It exists because of its religious importance, its cultural importance. We have a lot of international tourists that come here. Something like 25,000 pilgrims come here every day and leave it. But they come here for the ghats, for the ashrams, for the temples. And these need to be protected because they are the source of livelihood of the people. The administration uh, the and the people of the city got together in a committee and decided that there was need for protecting this. There was also a, um, a project of the Japanese International Agency that wanted to, do, to take a ghat as a model to see how to develop it, basing it on the resource of the traditional economic, social dynamics of that particular ghat. And they asked the Kautilya Society to do a um, stakeholder analysis and understand what people want so that what the JICA wants, what the Japanese wanted, what the local administration wanted, and what the people wanted was in consensus. The heritage committee that was established by the district authorities felt that the enlistment of these beautiful ghats of Banaras into the World Heritage List of UNESCO actually would have helped make people aware of the importance uh, not only to Banaras but to humanity of this unique treasure that is not only architecturally uh, beautiful but also culturally, religiously important and of value. Um, and the only way um, to get it into the World Heritage List of UNESCO, as UNESCO told us, was to get laws made and implemented that um, protect the city as well as allow the uh, city's uh, heritage to become a resource for development. Um, this was the reason that the district authority and the political people at that time asked the Kautilya Society to go ahead into the court and lodge a public interest litigation to protect these cards. In the last one year or so, there's been a judge bench which has been constituted only for the Ganga and the problems of the river as well as the cards. And this judge bench um, looked at the list of uh, VDA, of the, the list submitted by the VDA of illegal constructions and asked VDA to, to give it a, guy, uh, a timeline of what they would do and when they would do in order to 
resolve the status of these illegal buildings. So when the VDA went to demolish the buildings uh, on the ghats, there were massive demonstrations of the people against the authorities. And at that point, the officers of the authorities who were facing the people face to face said that they were not responsible. And they justified their action by saying that it was Kotila society that was responsible. They put the blame on us. But these are not the true traditionalists. These are people who are bigots. They, they feel they, they are empty. They don't have any longer the spirit of tradition. Because if they had, they would actually understand and value the need for people to move along with time. And they themselves would carry the spirit along and understand that today there is a need for women to come out and talk. But they feel that me as a woman coming out to talk against them as men is a kind of conflict that I'm creating and I'm doing. And that I'm not actually here to empower, but I'm here to fight against them. So they have to crush me. Yeah, they have to use violence on me because that's what they understand as the language. That's their language. But it's not people who are traditional because there are, many, there are many people who are traditional who are actually supporting me because they realize that the need for NGO role just like the need for the role of women which was not there earlier neither civil society was so important nor were women so important before in terms of public participation but now it's becoming important because women are becoming educated they're becoming aware they want to be part of the entire process social process of participation and development but these people don't realize they're actually short-sighted they don't realize that winning today is going to make them lose in the longer term and that what we are saying and what we are bringing forth is a is a process of dialogue and participation it's not a process it's not what we what we don't what we want is not conflict what we want is that there's a consensus to create those kind of laws that will make the enabling environment for even civil society and business to be able to function in a just manner because it's only when there is justice that there's going to be peace and if if there's no justice this kind of conflict is going to become worse and that's not what we want. We want dialogue, we want to protect the castle of Benares, but not at the cost of a conflict in the city. And what about the press? The press was very active in India now to defend the woman in the case of violence. So you're doing now social work here. What about the press of Benares? Why are not they supporting you? The press is for sensational news. And I think what they don't realize, they also don't know uh, what the matter is. They have not come to me to ask. But also, I think it's time for the Kotila Society to go into public and talk to people and uh, allow this sensational news environment of the press to be, uh, to be stopped and uh, to come into a more dialogic way of uh, communicating with the people. I think it's time we need to go to the press now. Students in India have been very active in in trying to protect the woman against all these new cases or, rape, or raping that have been emerging in India. What would you like now, you as a woman in danger and threat, to tell to the students now? I think the students need to rise up to protect their city. And the students need to rise up to, um, to squash this violence that is happening against civil society itself. Because this violence that is happening is not against me personally. It's against the very existence and role and need and presence of the civil society and the women in society. So it's not a direct physical violence, but it's a, it's a mental violence that actually pushes the women to go back into their homes. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very, very subtle violence. And if the youth don't come up now and say, no, we want each of us, women and men, to participate in, in, in our social, in, in the development of our city, it's not going to happen also. So actually, when you protect the environment, what you want to do is to protect the opportunities of the new generations. Of course, of course. When you protect the social environment, when you protect the natural environment, you're actually creating resources for the future. There's a very in, 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 important Indian chief, uh, Native American chief, who says that we, these resources that we have, whether it's natural resources or social resources, are not ours that we have inherited. We've actually borrowed it from the future generations. And that's what it is. That's what it is. Five words to summarize this documentary. One is challenge, because we really took a challenge outside of the media stereotypes. Uh, one is dialogue, 
because we found that the dialogue within the team as the way to narrate something that is not God's voice or not objective voice. One is travel because we realize that human research is always a kind of travel. One is poetry because we found the need of poetry in, in setting a global agenda. And one is hope because I found that there's much more good happening in the world than the kind of images that we are having about the world. So it's important and it's difficult, but it's important to give space to hope, space to celebration, in order as human beings be able a bit to be more happy of what we are. Francesco used extensively the footage we had collected together in the field. Besides seven short reportages that he broadcast in the TV7 news magazine of the Italian public television, he also authored a full one-hour documentary on the MDGs that was broadcast as a special report by the news channel of TG1. He continues to call the attention of the public and the policy makers in Italy on the work being done by civil society organizations. Fausto won a fellowship of the United Nations and is now working with the World Food Programme in Jordan for the Syrian refugee crisis. He wants to continue working in international cooperation. We hope he'll be able to run away sometimes from his desk and join us in our travels. Shachindra, who had left the glamorous world of commercial advertising and had gone back to the Himalayas as an independent artist and a mountain climber, was regained back by the media industry as the editor of this documentary. He is now planning to use media for social development and environmental education in the villages of the Indian Himalayas. Gauri had joined the team for learning and earning some money to continue her studies in archaeology. Along the way, she became our main camera person and has now decided to make this her profession. While working on this project, she realized that digging out human stories was much more attractive than excavating old sites. After completing the documentary, Stefano disappeared. We are not sure where he is, but we do see he's continuing to improve the online wiki handbook on development cooperation that also includes stories and interviews of this documentary. We hope he'll come back soon with new ideas for new travels together. Vrinda left working for large development organizations and she now supports small organizations in developing countries to access cooperation funds and network with donor organizations. In these activities, she utilizes the handbook that Stefano is writing and she also contributes to enriching it. The Kautilya Society continues its work for protecting and enlisting the Ganga Riverfront Ghats and the old city of Varanasi in the UNESCO World Heritage List. We hope that the stories and opinions we collected from the field will contribute to the ongoing policy debate that is gearing up for the International Millennium Development Goals Summit scheduled for September 2015 in New York.